Explained by the Billy Meyer contacts, mysteries, myths, legends, conspiracy theories, historical inaccuracies, and more. Compiled by David Chance, revised October 18, 2023. UFOs, a flying saucers part, one unidentified flying object, flying saucer mystery airship interdimensional hypothesis, see also Area 51, see also Aurora. Texas UFO incident, see also contactees general. See also contactee specific true and false, see. Also extraterrestrials general, see also extraterrestrials. Giza intelligences, the Baffeth, see also Foo Fighters. See also Las Lomas UFO, 1997 Mexico City, see also. Petrozavodsk phenomenon, see also Roswell UFO crash. See also time travel, interdimensional travel, intergalactic travel, interuniversal travel, see also Tunguska, event 1908, see also ufology, and spiritual science groups, and organizations note. This section generally deals with the various types of flying objects observed in the sky, plus the technical aspects of extraterrestrial spacecraft etc., which are frequently referred to by the extraterrestrials simply as their ship or flying apparatus. UFOs can generally be classified into the following explanations. See Contact Report 250. 59 to 89, naturally occurring phenomenon. See, for example, Contact Report 163 103 to 154, misidentified common objects airplanes helicopters, satellites, weather balloons, etc. Secret military aircraft and spacecraft see for example Foo Fighters, lies deceptions, fakes, frauds, etc. Delusion psychiatric disorders, hallucinations, bioorganic flying life forms from another dimension, rods, Resident extraterrestrial spacecraft descendants of extraterrestrials who have secretly resided on within Earth for a long time, Earth foreigners, future Earth spacecraft time travelers from Earth's future. See for example contact reports 602, 24 to 26, 608, 10, 651, 48 to 50, extraterrestrial spacecraft note. Including telemeter discs, real projection, images of actual spacecraft contact report 733 87 to 89, and teleprojection, images of actual spacecraft contact report 57 to 76. A. Clearant Federation. A covenant that extends far into the cosmos. Includes various solar systems and planets in wide space. And the total number of life forms of human norms invigorating them amounts to 127 billion units. Contact Report 23. 126 to 127. A community of independent worlds, or even a union of sovereign worlds, Contact Report 238. 931. The Federation is very broad and extends to a distance of 6.2 billion 6 billion 200 million light years, where in connection with our Federation, another member Federation exists according to our model. In between, between the two Federations, which have a sphere of influence of many millions of light years, there are isolated systems that also belong to our federations. Contact Report 248 188 189 Our Great Federation Which encompasses a measure of distance of 48 million light years. Contact Report 357 56 Our Federation that it is spread out over three dimensions. 
and that our two dimensions, ours and yours, are included, contact report 424. 88. 274 worlds. Spread over 702 light years, contact report 799. B. Others an excellent summary of the UFO, extraterrestrial phenomenon, is given by Billy Meyer in his article Extraterrestrials, found in Contact Report 257. Ta also states it quite succinctly in Contact Report 361. Flying machines of extraterrestrial origin are extremely rare to observe, because the Earth is far away from other inhabited worlds so it does not often receive visits from beings from other worlds. This happens only extremely sporadically, and therefore very rarely. So what can usually be observed in unknown flying? Objects around the world and especially over the entire American continent are not extraterrestrial unknown flying objects, but secret earthly flying machines of American and other origin. Arriving there, I did not have to wait long for some sort of thing which was still supposed to come there, because, arriving on the dome of the hill, I immediately saw a bright light plunge down from the sky and set down not far from me on the frozen hard ground. The bright light went out and I saw a matte silver and discus-shaped object which stood majestically quiet on three landing spheres and appeared to wait for me. The discus landing spheres were completely foreign to me because I had never seen such things with that kind of form before. After a short telepathic invitation, I approached the ship as if under a gentle compulsion, and at once was lifted in through an opening, just as if by ghostly hands, because there was neither a lift nor some sort of other entrance possibility. There was only one single armchair present, also I was not able to see anyone. The ship was quite obviously unmanned and was remotely steered somehow, so, without being asked, I sat in the single, but therefore very comfortable, armchair. The bright light which came from everywhere in the interior of the ship suddenly went out, and then suddenly I seemed to be sitting outdoors. No longer could anything at all of the ship and the entire setup be perceived, and when, in a reflex motion, I drew my left hand in front of my eyes, I was also no longer able to see it. The entire ship and I myself had simply quite suddenly become invisible. However, I also already started to move upwards, at an angle, into the night sky and slowly floated at a low altitude towards the nearby village, where I simply remained hanging just two meters over the house, which later belonged to my parents, while Askett's voice again suddenly sounded in me, and gave me a several minute long explanation, and indeed in relation to my further path in life, and that which was to come in relation to my family and my own family in later years. After this explanation, the still invisible ship, with me, started to move again, this time eastward and with suddenly raving speed, shooting high into the night sky without me thereby feeling some kind of discomfort or a pressure. For me, it felt just exactly as if unexpectedly I quickly went up in a lift but I could only enjoy this glorious picture for very short minutes. Short minutes which seemed like seconds to me, as suddenly everything around me began to glow dimly, and my vision blurred. Then the ship and I were suddenly visible again, and I could again discern everything in the bright light of the interior of the ship. Suddenly the entrance opening opened itself and I saw out into the outside. Completely unnoticed by me, the object had landed. Interested, I rose and stepped out, was floated gently to the earth and stood on hard, dry ground. I was still wondering about this sudden knowledge as I noticed something bright that plummeted, like a stone from the sky. Luminous and as big as the moon, I saw it suddenly emerge and plummet down. At a terrific speed, it became bigger, and all of a sudden, it simply stood still in the air at a height of about 80 to 100 meters simply without transition and without prior deceleration. The object appeared to simply remain hanging in the air. Yet then it sank slowly down to earth, so slowly, lightly and safely like a feather hanging on an invisible thread, 
and without any sound. For me, it was actually a spectacle which I will indeed never forget. This luminous and completely soundless object which lit up the entire surroundings as bright as day and floated down to then quietly remain on its landing place. And I waited a full half hour before something finally happened. From behind the ship walked a figure, which approached me within a few yards, while quite slowly the illumination from the ship dimmed and then went out. Yet already after a few split seconds the ship glowed again with light and radiated somewhat like twilight. After the greeting I was called upon by Ascot to climb into her ship which, to be honest, I did with somewhat peculiar feelings. Because this ship seemed to me to emanate something which promised to solve very many of my life's puzzles. The ship zoomed high into the sky and then became just as invisible as the one which brought me here and which had now invisibly remained behind, left in the tangle of rocks. And now the sinking became a gentle floating, down to a great pyramid which I had very well in my memory from many pictures, the Pyramid of Giza. I recognized it by the gigantic animal-human which, as a statue, stood not far from the Great Pyramid. And we sank exactly towards this animal-human object, the Sphinx. We set gently down on the ground, only a few meters from the gigantic construction, and only a few meters from a small Bedouin camp where various humans, dressed like Arabs, were already busy with the breaking of their camp at this early morning hour. They took no notice at all of the landing of the ship, and naturally I was astounded because of that. It seemed simply absurd to me that the people could not see us. Yet I then accustomed myself very quickly to that and found it very interesting that our invisibility really let nothing be recognized. Askit had, until then, not spoken another word, yet now suddenly her voice sounded in me, and then I felt her arm. I was not able to see her, because everything was indeed still invisible, as were Askit and I. But now she explained to me that she was attaching a small device to my belt, so we would also continue to remain invisible after we left the ship. I felt how she busied herself with my belt, and quite suddenly I saw Ascot kneeling next to me. Shocked, I spun around and starred across at the Bedouins, because now they would indeed have to see us. But then I heard Ascot's voice in me again, which explained that only we could see each other, while we were invisible to all other eyes. We left the ship, which I could likewise now see, and which stood so majestically next to the Sphinx, and, according to Ascot's statements, could be seen by nobody. That must indeed have simply been a mistake of hers, because I still was not able to comprehend that, because of the small device hanging on my belt, everything was actually only visible just for the two of us. Ascot's Explanations Part 1 3rd February 1953, and to fulfill our mission, we have to neutralize the space-time connection barrier between our and your universes, so that we can achieve a harmonious passage through without damage to ships and universes. In the state of being awake, he will be just as much tricked as his friends and acquaintances by images of spaceships which indeed can be projected so true to reality that anyone can catch them on film. These appearances are, however, without exception, only nebulous and holographic pictures which are not able to exhibit actual contours. The entire meaning lies therefore only in a malicious deception with the purposes that the concerned Earth human, who will be called Reinhold Schmidt, talks about himself and spreads the images and experiences and so forth, implanted in him by means of holographs and dream state hallucinations, in order to maintain the religion of Christianity. Ufology, already mentioned, which actually is supposed to serve in the spreading of truth, will likewise be pressed in the direction of sectarianism and will gain worldwide significance in this regard. Like the religions themselves, ufology will become a religious means of power for the malicious extraterrestrial intelligences and, however, also a field of activity of deceitful and delusionally sick, alleged contact persons. Ask its explanations, part two. By now it was very late and I was also very tired, 
so I lay down in the armchair that Asket had offered me to sleep on, which had been converted into a couch. She also lay down in her couch, which I could only just notice before I sank into a deep sleep. It was already broad daylight when I woke up again and saw that Asket had conjured up drinkable and edible things from somewhere. We sat down comfortably at a table-like structure that had been pulled out of a ship's wall and feasted on a hearty breakfast. What I ate and drank I could not define, but it was very good, even if everything was completely foreign to me. The potion was slightly yellowish-white and a little thick, and was probably some kind of juice from a fruit I did not know. The food also seemed to be made of fruits, and also of some kind of vegetables. The taste of everything was very foreign to me, even though everything once again seemed somehow familiar. Everything was excellent, however, and it tasted delicious to me. Before breakfast, Asket brought a large container of cool, clear water from somewhere, which she carried out of the ship and placed on the ground not far away. Like little children, we then splashed around with the delicious water and cleaned ourselves with it. It was a very fun morning toilet. At the present time, 1953, 2,700,000 thousand humans live on the Earth, of whom many have observed our beamships or other beamships belonging to our Federation or belonging to those who are strangers to us. Askett's Explanations Part 3 I was barely a few steps away from the ship when it slowly rose into the air behind me and then shot up into the night sky at lightning speed and disappeared high above. It had just become correctly dark when I heard a very low whirring sound, just as if a helicopter rotor blade was swinging out nearby. Then a dark object sank down not far from me and touched down on the dirt road. Unprompted, I walked towards it and suddenly saw a slender figure emerge. It was Asket, who was now calling me. Together we let ourselves be carried into her ship, and already we were sitting in the very comfortable armchairs. I did not feel the slightest movement as the ship rose and shot furiously into the night sky. Only on various screens did I recognize the takeoff maneuver and the rapid flight away. Nothing else happened. The ship neither became transparent nor glowed. It simply remained as it was, solid, tangible, and stable. During the flight, not a word was spoken, and Asket quietly busied herself with her apparatus. Then I recognized shadowy mountain ranges on the screens deep below us, towards which we seemed to be falling. But without feeling any discomfort, the ship suddenly came to a standstill from the frantic speed and simply stuck in the air for several minutes. But then it slowly started moving again and floated down to Earth as lightly as a feather. Ask its explanations, part four. So I followed her wordlessly to the ship and, together with her, let myself be carried into the ship by the invisible transportation powers. I lay awake for a long time on my comfortable couch and contemplated what I had heard. Asket also immediately got up from the couch and quickly approached me at one of the ship's windows. We then went to the ship together and then pushed Jitchi forward towards the transport beam in order to get him into the ship. Grasped by the power, he was lifted from the ground and slowly glided upward. Quite suddenly, his eyes widened unnaturally, and then a shrill scream tore the stillness. Once Asket and I were likewise in the ship, I saw how Jitchi, pale with terror, sat in an armchair and completely dumbfounded, stared at the entrance shaft. Contact Report 001 I am called Sim Yase, and I come from the Pleiades. Nice trip, if I may say so. How do you accomplish that? Maybe through the hyperspace? You often know more than we would like you to know. Well then, isn't it a little dangerous to leave your ship landed on the ground so openly when other human beings might pass by? Don't worry, because it is ensured that no human being can get closer than within a radius of 500 meters. The Earth humans have entire organizations that deal with reconnaissance of our beamships, but among them all, there is only very little material that is really genuine. They are in possession of very many photos, 
which, however, depict nothing more than some lights and light phenomena of natural origin or quite deliberate counterfeits. Only very few of these photographic proofs are genuine and really show our beam ships. Most of the photos are just montages or forged recordings made by deceivers and charlatans, whose names thereby became known worldwide. If the deceivers and charlatans were actually linked to us and, thus, were standing or have stood in contact with us, then we would have given them the opportunity to create very clear photo evidence of our beam ships. But since they are dishonest human beings, we have not given them this opportunity. As proof for this fact, we gave you the opportunity to take clear pictures of one of our beam ships. Contact Report 002 Thus, contactees who only saw our beam ships from a distance and were also often able to photograph them. But only very few had personal contact with us, and that is still the case even today. Most of them, however, wrap themselves in silence because they fear their fellow human beings. Also, many other pilots have encountered our or alien ships. Contact Report 004 If I look over everything and think over it carefully, then the shape of the beam ship doesn't play a major role. But a disc-shaped ship should be the ideal form because it offers the least resistance aerodynamically in the area of an atmosphere, which certainly should also be the case in the water. Sure, you have gotten to the heart of the matter again. Basically, though, the shape really plays no role. However, the disc shape guarantees the least resistance in an atmosphere, and it furthermore has the largest possible areas to make the drives on or through it fully effective. That is clear to me, but how is it possible that a beam ship can reach tremendous speeds in the gravitational field of a planet, or in its atmosphere, without it burning up, or the passengers simply falling victim to the immense inertial force? That is very easy to explain, and is also not a secret anymore to the Earth humans, at least not to the scientists. The beam ship is surrounded by a radiation protection belt, which allows every waft of air to be diverted immediately, without displacing it. Exactly the same thing also happens in the outer space, which is only teeming with inconspicuous, minute particles. Thus, this radiation protection shield has the function of protecting the beam ship against all external influences and resistances, without, without destroying or displacing anything that collides with the shield. All things intruding or offering resistance simply get deflected, without causing a displacement. A displacement would in fact already mean resistance, and lift the possibility of the unlimited speed. Through this radiation protection shield granting a sliding off, another important effect is triggered, which is of great significance and of vital importance for the passengers. As a result of the sliding off technology of the radiation protection shield, the gravitational pull of a planet is neutralized at the same time. However, this does not mean that it is simply destroyed, displaced, or canceled. In the same way, the air, as well as any radiation or particles and magnetism, etc., are simply diverted, with the result that the normal gravitational force and attraction force prevail in the beam ship. This means that a beam ship of the Earth harbors exactly the same attraction force inside as it also prevails on the Earth. This attraction force of a planet is not always equally strong, by the way, but is subject to a certain change, something which will be noticed by your scientists in foreseeable time. By the sliding off at the radiation protection shield, that is, the sliding off of the gravitational force, that is to say the attraction force, the beam ship practically becomes an independent miniature planet, which can to almost the speed of light fly through any atmosphere without risk. And since the attraction force of the planet concerned no longer has any influence on the beam ship, 
The passengers also feel as normal and unweighted as if they were on the planet itself, always provided, of course, that the planet itself corresponds to their anatomical capabilities and is not subject to greater attraction forces. In the beam ship itself, the attraction force is tuned to the passengers, of course, and is absolutely controllable. When passengers of beam ships from other worlds move on planets that are foreign to them and hostile to them in terms of atmosphere or attraction forces, then they use spacesuits and small transportable devices that produce exactly the same radiation protection shield for the respective being as it is characteristic for the beam ship. Contact Report 005 and there came the time when the descendants flew out into the unending expanses of the universe in round, plate-like flying ships with beam drives. Other solar systems and planets were flown to and expeditioned. Contact Report 007 Soon I will receive a new beam ship, which you can then also photograph at close range, in order to get rather good photos. Unfortunately, in my current ship, the automatic beams are still installed, which would destroy your films up to a distance of about 100 meters, that is to say, very precisely 90 meters. The radiation is not harmful to living organisms, but as I said, it would destroy your films. Task Part 2 Regarding my old ship, I would still like to explain that it is already several hundred years old and still represents one of the old forms. These old ships are still built according to the principle of corrugation, a form that has found application with us for reasons of stability. But now, these types are all going to be eliminated. For this purpose, mine will also be brought home on 3rd March by one of our pilots, and in company of a second, smaller ship of the reconnaissance class. Contact Report 009 The gift of observation of the human beings of Earth is very bad and superficial. They very often regard our beam ships as some kind of earthly airplanes, etc., where through they hardly pay attention to them more than a short fraction of a second. They are quite simply not used to a very precise observing and considering. But on the other hand, it is the case that we mostly protect our beam ships against any sight, so that the human beings are unable to observe us. It is a breeze for us to, just according to our wishes, protect our ships within a radius of 500 millimeters completely or partially, laterally, from above or below by means of a distortion screen against sight. Therefore, when I allowed you to photograph my ship from one side, it was shielded from further view on all other sides by the distortion screens so that no uninitiated persons were able to see it. Contact Report 010 the photo negatives and the first film footage you took of our beam ships would be very important to us. In the photos that you handed over to me, we have noticed some things that were previously unknown to us, but which are visible in the pictures. In particular, it concerns the guide beam of the antenna, which attracts energies. This is about a completely novel phenomenon in connection with the change of the earthly atmosphere, which makes previously invisible energies suddenly visible. Contact Report 011 Why did the radiation phenomena become visible? It only concerns atmospheric disturbances, which will dissolve in a few months. They come from your system's satellite Saturn, which currently influences the Earth's atmosphere. Through these disturbances, particularly the antenna's conducting beam and the energy-collecting beam as well as the regeneration radiation become visible. The antenna's conducting beam and the energy-collecting beam appear as a fine line of energy over the beam ship, while the regeneration radiation becomes visible beneath the ship in various hues. You speak of regeneration radiation. Is the captured energy regenerated again after consumption? 
the energy only becomes used and regenerated again for the radiation drive. It is not consumed, however, as you said. Our whole technology is aligned toward natural rectification, but not toward destruction. I understand. The natural principle is thus implosion and regeneration, rather than explosion and destruction. You certainly could not have expressed it more precisely. Various foreign objects have flown into the terrestrial space lately, but we cannot monitor all of them. As a rule, they also immediately leave the Earth again, as soon as they have satisfied their curiosity or thirst for knowledge. What was it then in the evening of the 20th of March at 1930 HRs? My children and my wife called me to the window because they saw, only about one kilometer away in the west, an object of reddish and yellow color moving from the north to the south. Also, various local residents had marveled at it from the street. That also wasn't one of us, but nevertheless, the event is known to me. It concerns a beamship of a race known to us from a neighboring system of our home. It concerns peacefully-minded beings who travel around space and worlds for expeditionary purposes. In particular, the Earth interests them, and therefore, their luminous beamships are also often observed here. Their technology is not yet as advanced as ours, and the beings themselves are also rather unconcerned about whether they are seen or not. What kind of beings or life forms are they? They are human forms, and what is very important is that they are peaceful and very interconnected with us, which cannot be said, unfortunately, of all who cross through outer space. Contact Report 013 It might be possible that someone has observed the start of my ship and reported this to the authorities or the army, after which a search might have taken place, which unfortunately happens here and there, if we are not careful enough or if some careless foreign ships appear or even land. Especially authorities and military feel very threatened in their power. When they are informed about sightings or landings of beam ships, etc. Although we are not interested in breaking or endangering their primitive power, because this task is incumbent solely on the Earth humans. But even though they are very interested in our beam ships and do research and investigations, the authorities and the military strongly deny these facts. All relevant information concerning spaceships, sightings and landings, etc., is therefore denied by them as much as their secret investigations and investigations of beamship landing sites, etc. Contact Report 014 I hear it too, Simyase, a tractor which is approaching. We must separate, otherwise the vehicle will be halted and switched off by the ship's protective shield. Contact Report 016 The danger created by this carelessness on our part is of less importance to you than it is to our cause, itself, and to certain research findings which would be made by appropriate investigations of your scientists and which would not benefit the human beings of your world in their present development. These scientific research findings could be obtained on and in the weather trees that I have used as objects of comparison for my flights. They absorbed radiation from my ship and absorbed it because I came into its immediate vicinity or even touched it with the ship. This radiation, which is absolutely harmless to any form of life, lasts for several months and could be detected and analyzed by your scientists, which would mean a very rapid increase in their research and knowledge. But not powerful in things, they would cause devastating catastrophes, which we cannot allow because it would be the direct fault of our carelessness. But since our technology, etc., does not allow us to simply paralyze the radiation absorbed by the trees or to remove it from the trees, there is only one possibility left, namely to eliminate these trees in the past, 
whereby, of course, all memories, written down documents and photos, etc., are also eliminated at the same time. There will be no remembrance of these trees and humans, exactly according to what I once told you about such eliminations. This is also one of the reasons why we always make our landings in such a way that we cannot be observed, because there is always the danger of radiation being emitted, which could be detected and analyzed by scientists if it were caught by anything. Contact Report 018 At a given point in time, which I do not wish to mention in advance for certain reasons, I will give your group once again opportunity to observe my beamship. In this regard, I have again chosen a time of night because everything can be observed better in the darkness. I will demonstrate to them the potentials of different energies, which will be very well visible as light effects in the darkness. However, some of the energies I can only bring to use high up in the atmosphere, because otherwise they would have a deadly effect on different earthly life forms. Nevertheless, everything will be a just as unforgettable demonstration spectacle for your group members as it will be for many other coincidental observers, because I will not use any protective measures to shield the site during the demonstration. During this action, you are kindly asked to observe very specific precautionary rules and also to be concerned that no other persons than you approach closer than 910 meters to my beamship, because this could have deadly consequences for them, or at least consequences which would damage their health or even their consciousness. In this regard, I will shield and protect you personally, whereby you will not suffer any harm. Contact Report 024 If you want, I can take you anywhere near where you live. And my vehicle? Oh, I did not think of that, because we cannot bring that into my ship. With a bigger ship that would be possible, but not with this one. Contact Report 026 for a long time, I have suspected that there are other extraterrestrials in our world besides you, but with very different desires and hopes. These beings may be wholly alien to your race, at least some of them, but others must be of your own race. So I start from the assumption that certain forms of life which are strange to you are trying to wander around from the vastness of the universe on our Earth and in the space of the world and to influence other forms of life in various forms. On the other hand, I also suspect that one or more groups of descendants of your old race have not yet returned to you, and that they are still living according to the forms of a deity. Since they still have to live according to the old forms, it can practically only be that they influence many life forms, and also the earth humans, according to this, and appear as emissaries of a god. With your speculations, you are very right, because there are other forms of life in the earthly space than just ours. There are also still some splinter groups of our own former races here, but also on other worlds where they still live according to their old forms. They constantly try to influence the life forms, especially the earth humans, according to their forms. Already the ancestors had appeared as gods, and they still do. They are anxious not to release the Earth humans in particular from this form and to continue to make them dependent on themselves through stoic references to religious heresies, etc., and to cast them under their spell. For a long time, they have been trying again to break into your world in order to subdue humanity on the Earth. On the other hand, many Earth humans are subject to deceptions, caused by hallucinations or by certain unconscious workings and intended illusory projections of the extraterrestrial life forms for the purpose of underpinning their heresies. Great suggestive influences for deceptive purposes also belong to it, as do appearances of many other forms. Contact Report 027 We go together to the beam ship 
where we are simply lifted into the ship by an elevator-like invisible powers and immediately stand in the cockpit, while behind us, the hatch closes automatically and completely silently. In the cockpit, there is a green-yellow light, which is obviously produced by the onboard windows, which are orange on the outside, but green-yellow on the inside. This observation also leads me to the first question. How come, Simyase, the ship's windows are orange on the outside and yellow-green in here? The outside is specially coated and changes color depending on the atmosphere. In an atmosphere that is beneficial to us, the material turns orange and throws this yellow-green light inwards. If the outside is colored differently, for example, green, yellow, red, or blue, etc., the inside light changes immediately. Without special analyses, we are thus informed as to whether or not we need a protective suit in the atmosphere in question. The failure of this type of atmosphere determination is completely impossible, and furthermore, the automatic system only opens the airlock and the exit shaft when the occupants are wearing the relevant protective suits. This is made possible by the use of sensing eyes or sensors, which find the appropriate contacts at certain points on the suits. If one wants to leave the ship in an atmosphere that is unhealthy to us, then this is only possible with the protective suit. Otherwise, the automatic safety mechanism is activated and all exits are locked. When we step out of those layers of a world where the atmosphere is lifted, the outside of the windows becomes transparent and clear and hardly differs from your clear glass. The windows also prevent the penetration of any radiation through the special coating, so there is no danger. They only let through neutralized light. For observation, we have our control devices, which enable us to look much more closely than looking out through the windows, which should not be very suitable for taking pictures, because the pictures probably become unclear, at least as long as the outside is colored. In higher layers, however, this should resolve itself, so you can take clear pictures. Contact Report 029 At the present time, we are the most highly developed life forms that travel this Earth from outside your world and are also stationed here. Although there are other life forms that penetrate your Earth space, fly in, and partly also have their stations here, we correspond to the highest level of evolution of all. The second most developed form of life after us lies little more than 1840 years of total evolution behind us. Of all present extraterrestrial life forms, which currently live in the earthly space, we are therefore a little more than 1840 Earth years ahead in the total evolutionary standing. Contact Report 031 We head to the ship and let ourselves be lifted by the transport beam. After a few seconds, the ship is already hovering high, and from an altitude of about 50 meters, I take some photos of the surroundings of the ship's departure point below. I take some straight from above, and others at an angle. I take them through the still open transport beam hatch while we slowly rise. After I finish, Simyase closes the hatch, and within seconds the ship shoots up several kilometers higher, without me being able to feel any acceleration or other external forces. It's just as if I was standing on solid ground somewhere on Earth. Also, several sudden changes of direction cause no effect, even if through the ship's window I can see that we often shoot in different directions like a crazy giant pendulum. But now, take a look at this equipment here which we have developed specifically to provide you with better photographic possibilities. You can simply put your camera against this screen and take photos of the outside. As you see, you can also look through this transparent material and see the outside, just as if it was a simple glass window. The device next to it, however, generates multiple radiations, which make visible or simply preserve the existing color shades, etc., of the objects, so that they may be captured on film. 
In this manner, you will be able to produce good color photos, or so we hope. The flight to Venus does not take very long, so I have just enough time to examine in more detail the equipment for making the photos. The viewing screen looks to me like clear glass, through which everything outside can be observed. I only notice that this whole viewing screen has a very fine resolution, similar to a photographic print. The size of the screen is about 50 UIC 50 cm and 20, while the color radiation device is installed on the side of it and recessed, so I could not examine its inner workings. Beside this device, there is also an oscillograph and many different kinds of apparatuses all around the cockpit room, installed within a circular control console and on the walls. All this strange-looking equipment, already seen on the first flight, is obviously used for the guidance and control of the beam ship, while also serving as exploration devices, distance meters, radiation control devices, and other such things, all playing important roles in the operation of the flight machine. All the display screens, except the oscillograph, however, differ fundamentally from all other apparatuses of Earth origin I have ever seen of similar type whereby all the appearing forms, symbols, and figures on these screens are expressed in beautiful and often fantastic colors and also extraordinarily vividly. Unlike the Earth displays that I know, which in practice are only able to display flat two-dimensional images lacking depth, these screens show everything in vivid three-dimensional realism, like they are physically real and not just a technically generated image. Simyase now sets the ship to fast speed and we go round Venus a number of times. When at 16, 30 hers we are back over the Earth. I can see several flying objects in free space. Besides two satellites of Earth origin, I can also see five objects which with certainty are extraterrestrial spaceships. Oddly, I cannot discern those objects through the ship's windows or the viewing screen of the photography device but only on the beam ship's image screens. Sim Yase explains to me that all the ships are masked from view and can only be detected through the special zero visibility screens. The zero visibility screens, she explains, use a special vision device that is able to capture and reproduce images of all that the naked eye and primitive monitoring devices such as radars cannot see or detect. Do you want to look inside the capsule? Soviet Soyuz space capsule. How would that be possible? The crazy thing is totally closed and made airtight. You don't know the possibilities of our technology, which allow us to distort all matter by radiations so that it becomes invisible to the eye. We are able to do this in a very controlled manner and can thus steer the effect very precisely. Then let me see your magical technique. Sim Yase busies herself with some instruments while spellbound by the photography view screen that was specially built for me. I look out in the direction of the Soyuz capsule. Suddenly, a part of the capsule simply disappears, and terrified I look at the two human beings who rest lying within the seats, which look like deck chairs or something similar. With our technology, we are 3,500 years of development ahead of yours. I turn to Simyase, who sits in her oddly shaped conformable chair, and directs the beam ship through the darkness of space. At a distance difficult for me to estimate, a huge metal sphere is hanging in the darkness of space, reflecting only weakly the light of the sun. Very slowly now the speed of the beam ship decreases. Simya Se is sitting very attentively before her instrument panels steering knowingly and carefully in the direction of the huge sphere, which looks to me like a small planet. I can see way down in the lower third, a little to the left, a big gap is opening laterally, which I soon recognize as an entrance hatch. It's doubtlessly a hangar into which we are now slowly flying. Innumerable beam ships of the same type as ours are standing there in orderly rows by rank and file and only a 100 x 100 meter square of the hangar entrance is cleared. I look back at the hangar entrance and can see how a wall is moving from bottom to top and closing the entrance. 
Everything all around is now brightly illuminated, and the light, which is light blue, seems to come directly from the walls. The whole hangar is huge, and this spherical ship, judging by these interior spaces, has to be gigantic. I ask Simyase for its measurements. How big is this spaceship, Simyase? It is big. It's even very big, and it's the largest of its type. It is a truly special ship, which embodies all the technologies known to us. Altogether, it is its own perfect world, a world that's able to fly. In itself, it contains a complete and inhabited city with 141,000 inhabitants. Everything needed for living can be produced inside the ship itself, and it is absolutely independent of anything of any kind from outside its boundary. This spaceship represents our latest development and has been working together with other ones of this same kind for four years now in Earth's chronology. They find useful applications as self-sustained expeditionary ships and for intergalactic order-keeping. They are able to move within all times and spaces, and for them, negotiating the barrier between universes is no longer an obstacle, whereby an all-universal community made of countless life forms can be included. After only four years in the possession of this great technology, we are regrettably still only in the early stages of our great task. That is still fantastic. If I understood right what you have just explained, you are able, with this great ship, as well as with the others of the same type, to shift from one universe to another? Sure, you have understood me correctly. However, this only applies to aligned universes. With the help of her Askets race from the Dal universe, we came into possession of knowledge of higher technological capabilities and received the most exact data for the development of these great spaceships, which we have been using, as I said, for four of your Earth years now. For Askets people, the handing over of this data was no problem because they mastered the way of overcoming distances that these ships are capable of more than 700 years ago. In Earth years, Askets' race is about 350 years ahead of us in development regarding all technological fields. But I am still interested in knowing the dimensions of this space giant. Can you at least tell me the mean diameter in meters? By your measure, it is exactly 17,182 meters. But now let's leave our ship because the room is atmospherically prepared for you as well. We are in a security room, which is fully atmospherically pressurized even when gaps are open to outer space. This whole space is nevertheless sealed off from the actual living area by invisible barriers so that security is truly comprehensive. We let ourselves float through the shaft by the transport beam and stand on the metal floor of the Great Spacer. For the first time now since I'm outside the beam ship, I realize that the cleared landing space of about 100x100 meters is surrounded by glass-clear walls and that innumerable other small beam ships are beyond these walls. Between these parked ships, many human beings are rushing about, quite obviously involved with the various ships. But I also see walking mechanical figures, quite obviously robotic, which are hurrying quite busily along as well, executing various tasks. Very far beyond, I am just able to see some bigger beam ships, which have completely different shapes from the ones hitherto known to me. Simya, say, occupies herself with a small device in her hand, and I see that before us the transparent wall opens and reveals an entrance. Then completely silently comes a small floating vehicle, not bigger in size than a Volkswagen car. It floats about 20 centimeters above the floor and is equipped with very comfortable seats on top. Sim Ya Se asks me to take one of the seats beside her, and the peculiar moving vehicle floats away and slowly rises higher and higher. I look back and watch how the transparent wall closes up again after our beamship is taken by the previously seen robots into the main hangar hall. 
This hangar hall seems to take up the whole lower third part of the giant spaceship for its complete diameter, up to a height of about 600 to 800 meters, 1,800 to 2,400 feet. The ceiling above, like the walls, also radiates a bluish light, which seems like the sky to me. And if I am not mistaken, there is a big opening above, exactly in the center of the ceiling. Soon I can see that this is so, as we head in this direction in our floating transportation vehicle, and we climb up inside this opening. Also inside this shaft is the same gentle blue illumination coming from the walls. For minutes we climb up with increasing speed, until Simya Se suddenly stops the floating vehicle and docks it into a side compartment in the wall. In here, there is an open space of approximately 2,000 x 1,000 meters and I feel myself completely transported into a magical world. Wherever I look, I see green fields, trees, shrubs, and flowers. A real little Garden of Eden in this space giant. This spaceship is its own independent little world. I mean, how far have we floated up inside this giant? How many meters? Some 11,000 meters. We have stopped here near the center of the ship, which is where the actual city is located. We will walk through the park's facilities now to another transport hub, which will lift us up into the main control center. This is located in the top of the dome of the Great Spacer. Slowly, we walk along narrow paths through the parks. The paths are soft and not made of metal but rather of some kind of plastic or something similar. Here is a fantastic world of flowers, of mostly completely unknown flowers and scents. But I also see flowers, bushes, and trees exactly like the ones I know from Earth. It's simply a true paradise. We only take 20 minutes to cross the park, and then we stand again before a transportation pit with a vehicle floating in front of it, which we then use to drive up it, if I may use this term. With increasing speed, we float higher again, and suddenly the firmament lies open above us. As far as my eyes can see, over the end of the shaft I see nothing but the infinite vastness of the universe. Stars twinkle, and I ask myself, how could we have simply floated out into space? Because we should not be able to survive up here where there is no air. I understand things quickly, though, as we reach the end of the shaft because at this end lies the cupola which Simya Se had spoken of. An enormous space exists here with console-like furnishings in which apparatuses and screens are embedded. Before them are human beings and an unknown-to-me form of life, which I soon recognize as being biomechanical. Real biomechanical humans' androids. The whole command center is a giant domed cupola several kilometers in diameter. Over the whole thing spreads the free cosmos, and I wonder how one can still breathe. Then I remember the completely transparent walls of the hangar, and it becomes evident to me that the whole ceiling of the cupola must consist of this transparent material. So I ask Simyase about it. Simyase, can you explain to me, what is this transparent material that the cupola is made of? Is it a kind of glass? No, it is not glass, nor any kind of glass. It is a very stable metal alloy, like the one used on the walls of the beamship hangar. You mean that everything is simply made transparent by technical means? Sure, all the walls, as well as the cupola, are completely stable and made of the hardest metal. However, through the radiations, that is to say, swinging waves generated by our equipment, we can make everything transparent. To the eye, it then appears just so, as if there was simply nothing there, or as if you were looking through clear glass. And once again, we float on the vehicle towards the middle of the huge command center. I can already recognize a horseshoe-shaped structure about 100 meters high, completely covered with apparatuses and image screens, and its center is overall not bigger than an average room. A single bearded man stands inside this horseshoe looking towards us. As Simyase brings our means of transportation towards an encircled area about 60 meters from the horseshoe, 
This watching man starts to move toward us, and I can now see him more clearly. He is wearing a suit similar to that of Simya Seik's. Now all three of us are sitting in very comfortable seats inside the horseshoe-shaped console. On the image screens, all the planets of our sun system can be seen. Ta, how fast are we going now? Look here, this instrument displays the velocity. You can read it very easily by yourself, even if you do not understand our script. In your understanding, these lines stand for the decimals, and these sharp arrow-headed brackets mark the hundreds. These half-height lines mark the thousands, and these point lines the hundred thousands. These ring lines here would mean for you the speed of light. Now you can just add up the values, and thus you calculate the speed yourself. This makes 289,000 kilometers per second. Is that right, Bata? You have counted correctly. Our terms are different, but they give equivalent values. Sim Yase turns to her father and explains what I meant by fantastic. He does not seem to understand it immediately. It is funny that I know these words in the Greek language since I have never known them before. Suddenly I am simply speaking perfect Greek, and I don't understand how, so I ask, How is it, Simya say, that I can suddenly speak fully fluent Greek? My father has turned off the language translator, and has instead turned on the language transformer. This device uses the ship's language computer. This converter is now continuously transforming the desired Greek language into impulses and transmitting them, your brain then detects these impulses, and with that, you can speak each desired word without knowing it beforehand. I don't know. As always, the only thing I can say is fantastic. Girl, what do you think? How long will it take until we are this far along on Earth? This will take several thousand years by your time reckoning. But for how much longer will we be flying through the universe? For about 30 minutes more, then we will transmit to a different, remote system. Transmit? That means, among other things, time travel, right? Sure, but you already know about this. Yes, but that was with Ascot and not with such a gigantic ship. And how will it be then, when I return to Earth? We would have to go back in time now, to return to Earth at the right time. That doesn't make sense to me because you said that you had to do something at a universe barrier. If that falls chronologically in our time, then it is no longer possible. You are not taking some important things into consideration because Sim Ya Say once explained to you the possibilities offered by our means of transportation, namely the use of hyperspace, by which space and time become paralyzed. Ta and Simya say turn to the instruments at the horseshoe-shaped console. Small light bodies light up, and dark picture screens come alive. Shapes that are completely strange to me appear on them, and for the first time, I hear a tone now, a very faint and somewhat soothing singing like metal. I look up at the transparent dome and see that stars of all sizes go by very quickly, and now suddenly merge into a milkish white veil. This only takes a few seconds, and now they are already recognizable as bright stars again, passing by at tremendous speed. But that only lasts a few seconds as well until they go along slowly like before. During this whole time, I feel somewhat weird, but I feel a very profound peace in me. We have made the first hyper leap. But with my watch, it's also strange. When close to Simyase's beam ship, the watch always went too fast or too slow. Come now, let's go down to my beam ship. Simyase takes me by the hand and pulls me to a kind of metal box next to the horseshoe shaped switch and control gear console. There is no door on the box, but instead, a hole in the floor measuring about one meter of diameter, which is illuminated by a shimmering blue light. A shaft that goes into an endless depth and seems to have no end. I look down and see that very far below, the walls of the shaft get closer and finally seem to touch. I cannot see the end. 
It's clear to me that the self-narrowing of the shaft far below is only an illusion. Man, and now we supposed her to step into it? Simply step into the shaft and let yourself slide down. And I jump. Man, I am really hanging in the air. Oh, now it's slowly going downwards. And now it gets faster and faster. Oh boy, this is really a sliding shaft. I look up. Aha, there comes Simyase as well. Man, this is great, but why am I suddenly slowing down? Oh, there is already ground beneath me. I am standing on solid ground now, and here are again all the many beam ships from before. We are at the hangar. We walk over to the ship, let ourselves be lifted inside, and already the hatch closes behind us. We are now ready to float over. The lock is open. I see that the hangar doors have opened themselves during our short conversation. Now the small beam ship slowly rises and floats towards Askett's huge spaceship, which hangs in free space only a few hundred meters away. As in the giant from which we departed, we float into an airlock, which however is very much smaller than the one on Ptah's space giant. Now we are inside, and immediately the opening closes behind us. Everything happens very quickly, and we then let ourselves float down through the exit to the floor of the small hangar. Here we stand now, and all around I see only metallic, light-emitting walls. There are no other beam ships in here, only ours. Without a word, I follow Simyase, who approaches a wall on the right side in which an opening suddenly appears, through which we pass now. And behind us, the small passage closes again. We are now in a cozy room with very comfortable seating accommodations and some structures which obviously have to be tables. Now a wall opens in the background on the left side, and another female human comes in. Nera, with us both sexes are acknowledged as both equally valuable and entitled. For this reason, our beam ships are also manned accordingly by male and female life forms, whereby every position is also filled alternately by both sexes. Where have Askit and Zimya Se gone to? They were in the airlock room just a while ago? I only fear that the photos you take of me and Nira now won't come out very well. I know from my stay on Earth that the images were always very poor when they were taken aboard our ship or in the surroundings. They mostly were very unsharp or simply blurred. This has to do with certain energy radiations which are harmless to living forms, but distort everything and often impair and change the colours of colour films. Sim Ya Se lets her ship glide out of the hangar, and a few minutes later we are back in Pata's giant spacer. Like the first time, we are carried up by a glider, pass through the park, and we go back again to the center where Ptah is sitting in his horseshoe. We can only make our ship visible on very few worlds. So we can't leave it either, and have to be content with looking at everything from the beam ships. That is why there are also various groups that are supposedly concerned with the enlightenment of things with us and our ships, but who in reality only use this as a pretext to consolidate and spread their religious sectarianism in order to thereby beat the world even worse into religious bondage. I have heard and read that our scientists are trying to make their own earthly beam ships. Is that true and how advanced are these things? This information is consistent with the truth to the extent that such flying apparatuses are in their infancy being built on Earth. However, they are not beam ships, but flying machines similar to our ships, equipped only with explosion engines or, more recently, with jet engines with recoil effect. The construction of such ships on Earth in modern times is not entirely new, however, for the first ships of this kind were completed in planning and construction as early as 1941. In mid-February 1945, the first flights were carried out up to altitudes of around 2,500 meters, developing speeds of just over 2,000 kilometers per hour. 
It was all commissioned by the Führer of the Second World War, Adolf Hitler. At the end of the war, however, everything was destroyed so that it would not fall into the hands of the enemy. Various plans and devices and apparatuses, however, were overlooked and fell into other hands. From these, various groups developed the disc-shaped ships of terrestrial origin that exist today. These flying discs, as they are called by the designers, naturally require their test flights to test their properties, etc. Many of these objects can therefore be observed by Earth humans as they are flown about to be flown in or tested. The largest of these terrestrial flying objects of this type already reach nearly 10 meters in diameter and are already quite numerous. Of course, this is quite vigorously denied by the governments of the states possessing them. However, their machines have often crashed because they are still rather poorly developed in all respects. But the uninitiated human beings of Earth live in the mistaken belief that these flying disks they observe are of the same kind as our beam ships and come from extraterrestrial worlds. So that is how it is. Then several of the UFOs observed around the world are not UFOs at all, but simply terrestrial flying disks. That is so, yes. Often, they are also forced to make emergency landings because their constructions, devices, and apparatus are still very inadequate. Their explosion engines and jet engines, which they recently also want to operate atomically, but which are still wishes for the future, very often cause combustion damage. Human beings who come into the vicinity of such combustion fires are so often also threatened by dangers of atomic radiation, starting from experimental atomic reactors, which are supposed to serve for propulsion, but which will not succeed for a long time yet. If distressed ships of this kind are approached by observers, by which I mean that they go near them, then they are often frightened by the occupants or even abducted and deported in order to ensure their absolute silence. Such occurrences are unfortunately not uncommon on the earth. But through the ignorance of human beings and various unreal enlightenment striving groups, they are invariably attributed to extraterrestrial life forms. In truth, there are probably also malignant intelligences from outer space that haunt your Earth or stray there, but there are not so many of them that they would be of great significance. Most observations of flying disks with human predations are of terrestrial origin. Earth humans should be aware of this when they encounter any flying disks whose occupants are well aware of the fact that very many human beings believe these objects to be of extraterrestrial origin. This knowledge is also very often exploited by them by imagining some gullible Earth humans as extraterrestrial intelligences. Aware of their religious power, they also do not shy away from pretending to be angels and God's messengers and appearing as saviors of earth humans, whereby they then proclaim the deceived gullible to be contactors and assign them mysterious missions which are supposedly for the benefit of earth humans, but which in reality only serve their own profit and the benefit of their own country's espionage. The most popular places of origin these malevolent deceptive elements and occupants of earthly flying disks name are Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. But also the nearest neighboring systems of your solar system have to serve for this, as well as the Pleiades in the coming time, when you will have become world famous through your contacts with us. In the process... My daughter Sim Ya Say and my person will also be falsely accused of being contact beings with Earth humans who are fraudulent in this respect, as well as alleged Pleiades beings who do not exist. Since through our technology all distances have become of absolute insignificance, we can leap here and there once closer to Earth, then again much further away. The order is unimportant. 
Everywhere it is appropriate not to let us be seen, so we have to wrap ourselves in our protective shields. We must only allow ourselves to be seen where the evolution in question and our directives permit. Sim Yase is busy with various of her apparatuses, and also speaks into a device in a melodic language that is incomprehensible and completely foreign to me. I know that my wristwatch always goes crazy when I get close to Sim Yase's beam ships. Look there. Father has already located the projectile himself and will destroy it. What you see there on the right is an energy emitter, or an energy gun, as I am sure you would say. High-grade energy is being emitted there, compressed into a block by another form of energy and directed at the atomic projectile. You know that your daughter has given me several opportunities to photograph her beam ships. Once my camera actually exploded in my hand due to some kind of swinging waves from the ship. This vibration factor was then switched off by you. My daughter explained to you at the time that we had found radiation on the photos and films that we wanted to analyze, which is why you also gave us the film material. Note, see Contact Report 11, Sim Yase Sentences 50-57. On the one hand, we found that some of the radiation had been caused by a planet of the Soel system, Saturn, and was now slowly subsiding. But on the other hand, we also analyzed radiation in Sim Yase's new beam ships, which caused mirage-like reflections. However, this radiation is neither dangerous nor significant. It does, however, have a tendency to cause an object to shift optically when the ship gets too close. Since Sim Yase maneuvered very close to the tree during your filming, it shifted optically. But this shift was only a reflection in a similar form as you know it from a mirage. In other film and photo shots, the same thing happened, but Sim Yase brought her ship right up to the trees. As a result, they were charged by the radiation and had to be totally eliminated for safety reasons. If you look at the pictures and films of these processes, you should actually also be able to detect shifts due to reflections in these two cases. You are already oriented to the fact that this great spacer could only be made by the help of Asket's people in the Dal universe. If we had not received their help with the many technological innovations, we would only become powerful in this technology in about 250 to 350 years. So it is thanks to Asket and her people that we were able to bring you on this flight to her in the Dal universe. That is interesting. I have already seen various weapons in Simyase's beam ships, but also in Askit's ship when she was on Earth. Svath also had weapons on board, and your space giant is also equipped with a wide variety of weapons. Now, how does this rhyme with various claims that extraterrestrial intelligences would not have any weapons, or at least would not use them? I know from various UFO reports today that it is always claimed that peace is produced by peace, etc. These are just crazy claims of fraudulent do-gooders who unquestioningly feign contacts with extraterrestrials in order to promote their fanciful wishes, which are extremely unrealistic. Neither we nor any other life form in this or any other universe can afford to have no or unsuitable weapons. Every single life form race in the universe has weapons of all kinds, just as you do on Earth. Contact Report 038 For a long time I have promised you that I will take you into another dimension one day. If you want, then we can visit this three-world dimension, although I would also have to order Father there. With my beam ship, I can penetrate into that or any other dimension, but I cannot return. We'll need Father's spaceship to do that. Contact Report 039 But how does it stand now, with the dimension gate in the Devil's Triangle? Can one see this? 
With eyes alone, it is not recognizable, but it is possible to make the radiation visible. Sure, I can make the radiation visible by my ship. Will I see that then on a screen? No, you may recognize it through the viewing window because the visibility of the radiation occurs through a radiation shield that is spread out by the entire ship. Exactly. I have always wanted to see if I can circle such a thing around myself. I have always watched you closely and now know a bit about the control and the initial startup of the drive. But did you pay attention to the speed just now? Of course. It was just less than 290,000 kilometers per hour. I did not want to grind the mill any further because of the time, and so on. You even said yourself that it is very dangerous if one exceeds the speed of light with a normal drive, or simply at all, without diving, at the same time, into hyperspace. But please pay attention here. If you should lose control, then simply press these three contact points in the grid. By these, everything turns to the zero position, and the automatic control mechanism regulates everything within a split second. Thus, no dangers can appear. 98. But despite everything, please pay attention to the speed. Mount Shasta is an old volcanic mountain with a partially still unexplored area in America, or more precisely, in Northern California. In the interior of the mountain itself is a small city, which is inhabited by descendants of extraterrestrials and which, here and there, also receives a visit from their space brothers from outer space. It is a very majestic race, peaceful and good, but which anxiously strives not to be discovered by Earth humans. Their golden spaceships of a spherical form, for they master spaceflight, can sometimes be seen when they do not protect these from view. We let ourselves slide down through the transportation chute into the hangar, where we get into the protective suits. In Simya Se's beamship, we then glide out into the primeval world and move about it for a long time. At various places, we leave her ship, and I can capture some dinosaurs and landscapes on my slide film. Sim Ya Se partially paralyzes the large animals from her ship in order to make the filming easier for me. The animals then stand petrified. The world there, note. One of three worlds existing in a dimension which was previously accessible through a naturally occurring dimension gate, which no longer exists. In the Bermuda Triangle, Can is about 870 years ahead of your time. Thus, the human beings are also accordingly developed in their technology and have their own beam ships, with which they arrive at your Earth every now and then. With Ta's great spacer, we glide out into space while Simya Se and I let ourselves fall into the transportation chute and, in the hangar, go to her ship. Soon, we glide out of the airlock into free space. Simya Se, where is Pata? I cannot see his spacer. It is in the protection of his radiation screens. You mean protected from view? Surely, because we are foreigners here. That is why I also had to put the protective screen into effect around my beam ship. The human beings of this dimension and time have, indeed, become much more peaceful than those on your world in your time. But they are still barbaric and quite aggressive, so they would force us to land, which would be very unpleasant for us. Look over there. That is one of their beam ships. Beam ships? Girl, then these elves already master space travel. Sure, they also have about 500 years more development behind themselves than the Earth humans of your time, which I already said. But still, look, the beam ships that they have, I know those from somewhere. I have seen those before. Wait, ah uh, yes, you... They look remarkably similar to the fantasy products of spaceships, which I recently saw on television. 
It was the broadcast of a futuristic story by the name of Orion. Note, possibly referring to a 1966 German TV show called Raumpatrouille, Die Fantastischen Abenteuer des Raumschiffes Orion. The ship over there looks deceptively like that thing on TV. That is, however, not the case. Consider what I already explained to you once before, namely that certain Earth humans receive data and information from external telepathic impulses, and unconsciously, so also authors and such people. Thus, they describe things and possibilities of the future and also make drawings and models. Through this, they slowly prepare the Earth humans, and in particular, the scientists for the coming events, cognitions, and forms, and give them the drive for development. Hence, if you now see the beamship out there, which corresponds to the form known to you, then for this, you can also find the reason for it in my explanation. If you want to take pictures on Venus, however, then you need a light source with your camera. I have various specialized, small beam ships with strong light sources. I will let two of these aircraft fly with you, so you can take pictures through their light. Then, she, Semjazi, goes back up into space, and there, I see a UFO flying over the moon again, which I had already noticed during an earlier flight, and which was christened Sewing Machine, by Hans Jacob. Of course I filmed this too. But we are hovering right over my house. Even so, any observers would not be able to see us. My ship is shielded. I let myself slide through the hatch, and suddenly I do not see the beam ship anymore. I raise my hand upward, and sure enough, my hand just disappears, but I sense that it meets with metal. Thus, the ship is there, even though I cannot see it anymore. So I leave, and as I am standing only a few meters away on the street, I feel a slight pull. I quickly go back with an outstretched arm, but I cannot feel anything. There, Simyase's voice penetrates into me. I am already very high above you, just look. I look up into the sky. There, a large light, which is now quickly becoming smaller, moves very quickly and vertically into the sky and soon disappears. Contact report 043. But now I think it is time for you to go home. If only I were home already. It is quite cold to ride a moped. I want to take you in front of your house. Fine, but the moped? You know that's not a problem. I keep it under my ship. All right, you want me to go get it? That is not necessary. I can just pull it up. Something new again? Let us go. Aha, we are floating. I already have your vehicle. Just look at this screen. Contact report 045. Quite simply, we would like to know what kind of metal you use for your beam ships. I can explain that to you. Through a transformation process, we gain it from lead. We extract this soft metal from many things. For example, from lead-containing atmospheres of stars and planets, from waters, from various plants, etc., as well as from various ore rocks of destroyed stars and planets, comets, etc., exposed to decay. Through a process that is very complicated on the Earth, we convert the captured lead substances into the soft metal lead, which we then convert into a hard metal form through further chemical-mechanical processes, which is much harder than your metal, which you call steel. This, however, is unsuitable in its form for beam ships, which is why it is converted by further conversion processes into an alloy with certain values and properties suitable for beam ships, about which I am not allowed to give any further details. The end product, which must have very special properties, then consists of an alloy. I understood that so far, but what metals does this alloy consist of? Do we have similar metals on the Earth? Sure, you have the exact same metals that exist all over the universe on the stars and planets and so on. 
This, however, does not mean that all metal ores which are present in the universe are to be found on the Earth. That is to be assumed, but you have not fully answered my question. I wanted to know what metals the alloy was made of. Let me explain that to you. It is a copper-nickel-silver alloy that also contains gold for certain beam ships. Contact Report 046 I also brought you some metal from three different operations. This is the product of the third transformation process. This is the product of the fourth process, and this is the product of the fifth transformation process, of which there are seven in total. Thank you very much, Simyase. You give me a great pleasure. Now I do not quite understand things. I thought you could do the conversion of lead to alloy right away. But now you are saying that seven different processes are required? Sure. I guess I was not clear enough about my explanation. The first step absorbs the lead substances from the atmosphere and compresses them into pure lead. The second process removes all dangerous radiation from the metal obtained in this manner. The lead then enters the cold converters, which, without the addition of any other metals, convert the lead into the alloy in several processes. So you mean that the lead is liquefied cold and only undergoes the transformation in this form? Certainly. There are probably direct conversion possibilities of matter, but these possibilities are not yet extensively given to us. However, our scientists have already achieved good experimental results. At present, however, we still transform the metals in the traditional form through the cold converters. And as I said, this happens in seven different passes. The metal is liquefied cold, like it is done in your blast furnaces by heat, and then undergoes a transformation by certain vibrations, but only up to a certain value, so different operations are required. The respective end product is then pressed through a cooling spiral in intermittent batches, resulting in small structures such as those in front of you. This process is repeated several times, whereby the value of the various metals increases with each new process and becomes the final alloy. The sixth working process then produces the complete alloy, while the seventh process produces finished metal plates. Your explanation is to be understood. But how is the pressed metal cooled in the spiral when everything is already being done by cold processes? The cooling spiral contains ordinary water, which, however, we obtain by condensational process, especially for this purpose. What I call the cooling process has to do with the fact that the material is hardened. It is only now not yet clear to me how you actually process the metal, because neither on your beam ship nor on Ta's giant box could I see joints or seams, etc. Nothing is riveted either. For this purpose, we use a device that you would call a welding machine. However, it is based on a vibration technique that liquefies the metal in a cold state and allows it to flow into each other, making it absolutely seamless and forming a single piece. That is why we do not know about grinding metal like you do when you do welding and then have to grind away the seams to level it out. By the way, in this respect, you use a very dangerous procedure on Earth. Our technology ensures that seam breaks or tears can never occur. Contact Report 048 When I leave, I will thank him, Jacobus Birchinger, by letting him see my beam ship. I will also give him a little demonstration by doing an electric energy elimination which he can observe very well. What will happen is that I create an energy ball with electricity drawn from the atmosphere, which I then eliminate completely by a combustion process. But he has to be patient a little bit, because under a height of 2,500 meters I am not allowed to do that, because the burning energy falls to the earth and is very hot. Anyway, you shall take several pictures of my new ship. What does the new vehicle look like? 
The measurements remain approximately the same, and only small changes occur in the outer cladding. The great innovations are housed inside and offer many more possibilities than is the case in my current ship. With the new one, I am also able to penetrate dimensions in both directions. Contact Report 049 In addition to your friend, you have brought a person unknown to me. The automatic transmission of the control unit interrupted the contact, so I had to take over the control of your arrival myself. The swinging waves of your friend Schutzbach were not stored in the control device. Therefore, the automatic system interrupted the contact. However, I will now save the swinging waves. Contact Report 050 Already at the level crossing, I had to make you wait because a man followed you with his car. I switched off his vehicle before leaving the forest by supplying the car engine with a magnetic current. I am here with five of our reconnaissance ships which analyze everything. Is this maybe related to the unexpected fireworks you gave after the last contact? With certainty, because the light track is visible from afar. I can imagine that everything has to look like a glistening sun. But do you not have any other options? I mean other manifestations and colors of such light works? Sure they exist for us. You told me last Tuesday that the energy fire was about 170 meters long, is that so? Then, it must have actually been visible from afar. Certainly, that is so. Well, Mr. Schutzbach and Mr. Birchinger are still interested in how high in the sky you actually were when I arrived at their gun range again and you suddenly disappeared into the sky. According to your measurements, I was 22,000 meters high. Contact Report 052 The light of the telemeter ships corresponds to a special value and serves the course determination. As you have rightly noticed, it has a certain interval and is very bright. These are radio-like impulses which serve the control. If you now extinguish these, which you consider to be light, by your thought forces, then the telemeter ship gets out of control, and it moves out of course uncontrolled, so it must first be brought under control again by the station on the Earth. Yeah, goodbye. My thoughts will be with you. It is often very... I only hear the last words of Simyase weekly, and the rest of the sentence not at all anymore, because I glide down the anti-gravity shaft and remove myself quickly, sit down on my moped and drive away. Contact Report 054 If you like it, then you may set your smoking goods on fire at any time also with us. I have no need for that. Why, I do not know. This will be the environment and also the somewhat different composition of our atmosphere, which will give you the same invigorating active substances, but unlike the tobacco-burning substances, these are not harmful to health. Contact Report 055 None of us was there, but it turned out that there was indeed a ship but of unknown origin. Quetzal was able to clarify that it was a ship with an electrical energy combustion engine that was apparently in distress and had a defect that could be repaired. They pointed out clear residues of radiation traces, together with combustion phenomena in the plant world, as well as that four fruitless start attempts had been undertaken. But that the fifth attempt succeeded, this also explains the intense glow you have seen. With the yellow light appearances we noticed in the grass of the airfield that four further ships of the same kind must have stayed there. There were no burns to be found, but residues of electrical radiation energies. According to the measurements, these were probably small ships with a diameter of less than four meters. These devices must have escaped our monitoring as they were not registered by us. They were certainly surrounded by protection shields. Moreover, these apparatuses are no longer in terrestrial space, which Quetzal was able to analyze, 
but this does not mean that they will not come back. Now another question. You explained to me at the beginning of our acquaintance that your beam ships are equipped with a light-emitting drive and further with a tachyon drive. Is that why you call the ships beam ships? No, because the drives you mentioned do not correspond to direct beam drives. The beam drives were of a different kind, and we have not used them for about 400 years, although we have kept the name beam ships for ourselves. My ship, which I still had in my possession at our first encounter, was still half radiant, which is why you were able to see the radiations. However, these were only highly concentrated light beams. My last ship already had an anti-gravity propulsion based on the principle of repulsion. However, this drive was only suitable for planetary flight, while the tachyon drive was retained for free space. The present ship is equipped with an antimatter propulsion system for free space, which was developed more than 50,000 years ago. How heavy is your current ship with the construction? It is about 700 kilos heavier than the last one. That would be 112 tons? Certainly. Contact report 057. Has one of your spaceships ever been left behind on the Earth? We have not lost any spaceships on the Earth because the question is probably related to that. Has one of your beam ships, a reconnaissance ship or a telemeter disc, ever crashed since you returned to the Earth? No, our equipment of this kind and those we have here are completely crash-proof. So I want to ask the first question. Amata writes it this way. Are these large ships, which I see again and again, with a large superstructure and many cabins, simply spaceships, or even large capacity ships? How many people are on a ship like this? This description of the objects is neither one nor the other, but quite simply very large emigration ships with an average diameter of 120 kilometers, with a capacity for human life forms of around 1 million. These gigantic ships serve exclusively for emigration purposes, especially when a world is very endangered and destruction is to be considered. These are the same giant migratory ships that were used by our ancestors at the earliest times, when they came from the Lyra Vega region to Earth and later also settled on our Playaren constellation. Their external shape and size have been maintained since then but they have been subject to constant innovations of a technological form, so they are equipped today according to the state of the art. When Amata received our teleimpulses as teleprojections, she saw everything in an extremely reduced form, because she would not have been able to grasp and overview the gigantic size and the reality of it. Aha, uh -huh. then she practically saw something like models. No. That is not quite so, because she sees the projections as quite large. Contact report 059. It would be very valuable for us if we could film and photograph good tracks of your ships. Would it be possible for you to ground the two barges instead of letting them float, so that the plate marks in the grass would be visible, which we could then capture on film? It is not advisable to leave tracks but I understand your concern. We will put our beam ships on the supports. We go back together to the ships, which Quetzal and Simya say have settled on the land supports in the meantime. Contact report 061. Take a look at this photo. Are these the two reconnaissance ships? Certainly, but only the ionization shells are visible. We have already noticed several times that the grass and bushes, etc., are pressed down anti-clockwise in a spiral inwards to the center when the landing supports of your and Quetzal's ship are lowered down. That is not understandable to us, because as I have seen, the plates of the landing supports do not rotate. The round surfaces of the landing supports, like the whole ship, vibrate in a spiral-shaped anti-gravity vibration, 
which, as you have rightly observed, forms counterclockwise from the outside to the center. The underside of the ship has four such centers, three of which are located in the landing supports, while the fourth forms the center of the ship in the underside part. Well, that sounds quite plausible. But how is it that the grass or undergrowth does not stand up again after some time, but grows unchanged for weeks in its spiral path along the ground? We now have tracks that are more than four weeks old and that have not changed in the least. The new grass and undergrowth, etc., simply grows up again between the spirally curved stalks. The anti-grav swinging wave, which is much stronger than the gravitational vibration of the planet itself, causes a gravitational change in the plant life forms. Thus, they hold themselves down by a very minimal anti-gravity force, that is to say, a counter-gravity, and counteract the normal gravitation of the Earth, then they continue to grow, lying in their spiral form, because the plant forms are not damaged by breaking off. In these cases, the anti-gravity vibration does not lie under the plants, but on them. So if it presses them down from above and repels the gravitational force above them, the stalks remain lying. Of course, the gravitational force of the Earth itself also plays an important role, which makes its attraction effective. In a few minutes, another one of our ships will land, one that will be a bit unusual in your eyes because it is a product of one of our other races. The ship is led by Minara, one who is gentle in love, a young woman from the planet Deron from the Vega system. It is a, ah, Minara appears. She will be here in a few seconds. But look, there Minara comes up in the antigrav. The girl walks and disappears into the antigrav, which gently carries her down. A few seconds silence. Contact report 063. Can Minara also come then? Maybe she can also leave tracks someday. Of course she will come one day, but with the tracks it might be a bit more difficult. For planetary flights, her ship has a propulsion system that generates gas clusters close to the Earth, which ignite and scorch the ground. That is why she usually does not set her ship down, but lets it float. It would burn everything within a radius of several meters. I just went through several newspaper reports today about a UFO in Persia. It is supposed to... I know the reports, but we were not able to clear things up. Our telemeter disks indeed registered the entry of an object unknown to us into terrestrial space, but it had simply disappeared without a trace and could not be found by any means when we tried to do so. Those stupid cows there, they are still moving across the whole neighborhood together. If only they could be quiet. They are affected by my ship. They are influenced by the vibrations of the safety devices. But tell me, was his Svath's pear-shaped ship one of your usual ships? You had a completely different 300-year-old box. His ship was a gift from Assyrian people. You mean from people of Sirius? Sure, from one of the two inhabited planets of Sirius, but in a different space-time continuum. Contact report 064. This is typical for the human being of the Earth, because he or she always reaches only for the material and completely overlooks the fundamental values, namely the spiritual and consciousness-based ones, about which he or she then makes up unbelievable fantasies and even claims that jet ships and spaceships etc. are driven by spiritual forces and that they are also built according to spiritual models, etc. This is as malicious a misleading claim as the one that we were moving in paranormal realms. Unfortunately, my sister is also traveling with my ship at the moment, which is why I came here with Minara's ship, which also does not have the same technological possibilities as my aircraft. 
Contact Report 069. But tell me, why and at what time did these dwarves land in that forest? They landed there because a small impulse transmitter of ours is installed very close to that place, which serves as orientation for our telemeter ships. They registered these impulses and subsequently descended there. Contact Report 070 You told me recently that an Earth foreign spaceship has been roaming the Earth space for months, seeking contact with Earth humans, but that it does not dare to do so. Where does this ship come from and why do you not make contact with it? It is very strange with this, because with all possible means, we have tried to contact them uselessly so far, and when we appear, the ships flee. Why now, all of a sudden? Because there are several of them, as we have now discovered. All of them are of a white radiating or green radiating color, often with a strange red orange tail behind them, containing substances unknown and alien to us, which are currently being analyzed by our scientists. With regard to these objects, our probability calculations still reveal some indefinable surprises. Contact Report 073 A Note This seems to be an attempt to use a walkie-talkie from inside Simyase's ship. But say, can I not actually talk to my people from here via the radio? You have already tried it several times, but you did not succeed. But now to the radio again. So you got the point that I had pressed the talk button each time? Sure, but the ship absorbs everything and you cannot penetrate out with your device. Look here, connect your antenna here, then you can talk and have connection with the other devices. Good, uh, there's Cloton down there. Does the ship light up outside now? Sure, but only weakly. But it still cannot be detected by radar. Wait a minute, there... You see, there on the screen I have Muranos three again, that of Jacobus. He sits behind the wheel of his car and watches the sky far in front of him. Do you think he will see us? Ask him. I will switch on the amplification system. Muranos three, do you see us? We are hovering right above Cloton Airport now. M3, yes, I see you, but only very faintly. Wait, we are making stronger light. Sim Yasema, please let the box shine. M3, Miranos 1, now I see you very well. What do you think if you just let me slide down in front of Jacoba's car when you bring me back? As you like, but I will let you float through the mechanical teleporter. This is a teletransmitter. It is a transmitter in the field of dematerialization and rematerialization. All you have to do is climb into the shaft as usual, and I trigger the transmission, which will cause you to appear directly in front of your friend's car at the same moment as if you had grown out of the ground. In a moment, I have disappeared from the ship and am suddenly standing in front of the car on the street as if grown out of the ground. Contact Report 075. I will let you down with the teleporter, right next to the old man there. He is Jacobus' father, isn't he? That is him. He will soon be 80. Can you still let the ship buzz a bit about this? You know, as a surprise? Sure, but you will not hear it in the ship. It's not for me. Well, then I get out. But do not just let me get off, or I'll break all my bones. We are quite high above the trees here. You know that such mistakes do not happen. Contact Report 076 Manara. You see that I am here with Quetzal's ship, which earlier was piloted by Simyase. So you also know that time jumps can be made here with this device. Which is why I think that we can discuss the necessary. Things in peace before I make a time shift and bring you back to the place where you left your wife in such a hurry just a few minutes after the time to rush to me.
Contact Report 077. I do not think anyone noticed that I suddenly disappeared from the middle of the group, brought here by your teletransmitter or whatever it is called. But now I want to let you go back, for down there everyone is in great excitement. Because all your friends have meanwhile noticed that suddenly, without leaving a trace, you just disappeared out of their area. Let yourself slide into the shaft. A few hundred meters of empty depth yawn beneath the shaft. I stepped into the exit shaft and fell into emptiness, to stand at the same moment again at the same place on the scaffolding, where Ptah had taken me away about 35 minutes before. Contact report 078. But now, tell me why all the dogs here and also the chickens do not behave crazily, because usually they always do when there is a beam ship nearby. Today, however, the animals behave completely normally, if I exclude the mother dog, Anita. Why is that? Minata. Your question has to be answered to the effect that my ship is not a beam ship, but a flying apparatus with a compaction aggregate that can fly by densification and the highly compressed emission of atmospheric gases. This does not agitate the animals, whereas with the beam ships which emit radiation and swinging waves, the animals get excited, become restless, and even run away. Aha, and with what propulsion do you fly in space? Manara. My ship, which I currently own, is not capable of spaceflight. Oh, I see, but at least you can screen it from sight. Where did you leave it anyway? Minara. It floats directly here above this place, 27 meters high. And we have known the technology of shielding for 42,783 years. Minara. An examination by a telemeter apparatus has shown that you have been financially damaged for a long time because you were too trusting in this respect. Contact Report 079. When Minara and Elena were here on July 6th, I took a lot of pictures of the ray gun and the tree that was shot through. Afterwards first, namely on the slides, we made some quite strange observations. First of all, there was Jacobus's tractor photographed in different pictures, although at that time it was not in the place, but in Wheela. In second and third place were the shed and the dwelling house, respectively the part of the barn and the wooden gate next to it. The passage and the trees, etc., so crooked on the pictures as if the film had been damaged by heat and had caused distortions. But this is not the case, because the films are completely in order. Could it therefore perhaps be possible that these things were caused by the protective shield that Minara had placed around the area from the ship? The reference of your first question could not only be so, because it really was so. Minara erected the protective shield so that which you mentioned could come about to explain to you, and of course to all the others in your group, what we can do with the protective shields. The explanation for the processes is very simple. The appearance of the tractor on the film is an as yet unknown form of visualization of all matter by a type of infrared radiation as yet unknown. Probably the earthly science is so far along that it knows of the infrared light and many of its application possibilities. So, for example, such as making any matter visible, which has already been removed hours or days before from its location to be photographed. The relevant and previous earthly technique is usually only able to capture shadow outlines, while our technique is so far developed that an object is reproduced in all its details and true to nature. The tilting, as you call it, of the buildings is quite simply due to the fact that everything that is not in the immediate range of radiation appears blurred or distorted, while in the process with the tractor, the former location was in the immediate range of the radiation. For some members of the group, the registration apparatuses have recorded that the appearance of our ships or demonstrations carried out, or to be carried out, by us are evaluated in such a manner that they serve to brighten up and loosen things up. But on the other hand, 
they also find an evaluation of privilege and sensation. This is partly because more and more steps have been taken by various departments of your army to monitor you in particular, and under certain circumstances they hope, erroneously, to get hold of us. This special part is also the reason why we have not recently ordered you out to our contacts, but have brought you directly into our ships through transmitters. With regard to the members of the group, who now think of our appearance as a visual privilege, etc., I would like to explain that we are in no wise averse to releasing our ships to their eyes in demonstrations, but not for reasons of privilege or sensation, but simply because we feel joyful about their own joy, and because we would like to promote joy in all of them in dear solidarity when they can observe us at demonstrations or otherwise. But that gives nobody the right to demand that as a right. I also got a glimpse of why so many telemeter discs were pulling away over the center. Sim Ya Se Silver Star Center because of the facetted trajectories of the magnetic currents. That is also correct. And if you are talking about it right now, you should really refrain from your pranks in the future and not take the discs off course at every opportunity you get. Although our technicians have now equipped them with special track stabilizers that work automatically when the corrective illumination is switched off by thought influences, these stabilizers are not yet so perfected that they are fully functional. And what about your technology? The prepared track stabilizers of this form have only been developed since then, since you have been constantly driving the discs off course with your funny pranks. We were not aware of any problems about this before, which is why a new invention first had to be made, which is not yet fully developed at the present time, but which will be soon. Not much can happen if I let the little things dance a little across the sky, can it? Or do the little apparatuses suddenly flash down? They cannot crash, at least not ours, but there is a danger that they will collide if they suddenly stray from the prescribed path and fall into the trajectory of another. It will not be that bad, because then they just dissolve, as you once said. Sure, but that only applies to our own registering discs. Those of the other participants would crash. But it is still kind of fun to direct the things a bit. I know you, like every human life form, need the constant testing of your powers of consciousness. But please use them elsewhere, only not directly on our telemeter discs. Contact report 080. Sure it is. Ah, just a minute. So, a plane approaches them. He almost rammed us. That is Coney with his flying rust bucket. He cannot see us, so we cannot blame him. Besides, he could not ram us, as you say, because he would be thrown back by the protective belt of the ship. It was a bit dangerous for him. Now he banks there without knowing that his crate was almost smashed. That could not have been possible, because the protective sensors would have taken the ship off its flight course on their own. Then he was lucky again. Nothing could have happened to him. My ship has many forms of weapons, as you know, such as a ray projector of a similar shape to the one you use to make the hole in the tree. I will destroy the nest by burning the surface. Here, through this site, you can regulate the dimensions of the rays, by which I mean the radiating surface of the beam. You can move this disc here through this sliding device and thus regulate the further radiation. This allows you to precisely define and determine the entire combustion source. When you then touch this small elevation, the energy escapes from a hair-fine opening on the underside of the ship in order to destroy the target through a form of radiation. Here, you can still regulate the strength of the combustion so that you do not hurt the tree any deeper. You did not follow my instructions and just aimed at the target, made the adjustments, and released the energy. Sure, 
Yes, that was very good, only the beam was a bit too big. I am sure you only laugh when I explain to you that we first have to spend several hours with this device in order to be able to operate it properly. Contact Report 081 I am now aware of this because our permanent analyzers, which we recently used to clarify your concerns, drew our attention to it. 